let's get uh, things started. Um, we'll be participating in a joint event, Carnivale, uh, a fundraiser on February 25th at Casa Italiana with several other organizations. So stay tuned for details. There will be details presented on our website and also in the um, Poke Parole, our newsletter. And at this point, we don't have any other social meetings planned for February, but who knows? Yes, we may do something. We'll see. February 8th. Ah, go ahead. Francesca, February 8th, we will have um, another event at SAIS about slow food. So we had an anticipation uh, in uh, November. And uh, we will have a debate. Um, the executive director from New York will come again and we'll have a, a panel discussion at size. In, uh, no, no, in size uh, here, in Washington, D.C., in collaboration with the U.S. Italy Global Affairs Forum. So size is S A I S. What does it stand Johns for? Johns Hopkins University, uh, School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University. There you go. Okay. Uh, we'll send you an email. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so today is a great pleasure to uh, welcome eight to welcome our special guests, uh, panelists, uh, Professor Laura Benedetti of Georgetown University and Dr. Anna Lawton, Lawton of uh, the New Academia Publishing. We'll be in conversation about the works of the Italian author Elena Ferrante who has caused such a sensation worldwide with her acclaimed Neapolitan Quartet and other works. Professor Benedetti is the Laura and Gaetano de Sole Professor of Contemporary Italian Culture at Georgetown. Her publications include La Sconfitta di Diana, Un Percorso per la Gerusalemme Liberata, The Tigress in the Snow, Motherhood and Literature in 20th Century Italy, and the editing and English translation of Lucrezia Marinella's Esortazione alle donne e agli altri, and most, most recently a novel, Un Paese di Carta. She was guest of honor at the American Association of Italian Studies in 2016 and a recipient of the Flaiano International Prize for Italian Studies, the Wise Woman Award from the National Organization of Italian American Women, and a gold medal from the Federazione Associazione Ubrizzesi USA. She has published extensively on Elena Ferrante's work and was recently a guest on the Diane Rehm Show. Anna, which was devoted to the author. Uh, Anna Lawton earned a PhD in Russian literature at UCLA. She taught courses in literature, cinema, and visual culture at Purdue uh, University and at Georgetown. She's also worked for the USIA at the American Embassy in Moscow as Deputy Director of Public Information and Media Outreach. Maybe there'd be less fake news if she were there right now. <laughs> <laughs> and as the Editor-in-Chief of the magazine Connections, and also as the managing editor of the magazine Development Outreach at the World Bank here in Washington, D.C. Anna has directed conferences, seminars, film festivals, and so forth for many institutes in the area, including the Kennan Institute, the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian Institution, the Library of Congress, and for the Italian Embassy in Washington, among others. She has published three scholarly books, numerous scholarly essays and book chapters, two novels, album the Familia and Amy's Story, and she's received several awards, including the Choice Award as Outstanding Academic Title in 2005 for Imaging Russia 2000. In 2003, she established New Academic Publishing, and which remains today a successful enterprise. Please give our guests a warm welcome. Okay. So, okay, very good. Uh, so, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Ron, for your kind introduction. Thank you, Francesca, for, for all your hard work to uh, make this event possible and to uh, all of the members of the Italian Cultural Society and to all of you for being here. It's, it's great to see such a, such a uh, big crowd. And uh, uh, usually when I, uh, when I uh, participate in these events, uh, first of all, th there isn't quite a big crowd. <laughs> and second, I often talk about, uh, uh, about fairly obscure authors. Obviously, this, this is not the case today. Uh, so since we expect uh, most people in the audience to have read the Neapolitan novels, 
Anne and I thought of organizing this event more like a, a conversation. So we'll start the, the conversation between the two of us, but then we would very much like to, uh, to uh, enlarge this conversation to uh, all of you who have read the, the novels and who uh, I'm sure have a lot to say about the novels. So. And thank you, Anne, of course, for being here. <laughs> well, um, is it working? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, well, I uh, uh, joined. Uh, Is it turned on? And closer. Okay, and closer. Closer? Yeah. Like this? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, it's not on. Because it's, it's red for some reason. No, it's correct. Well, anyway, uh, um, I uh, want to join Laura in uh, thanking the uh, uh, organizers of this event uh, at uh, IPS and uh, all of you that uh, um, have come to uh, participate in this conversation. And uh, let me start immediately with my uh, first question. Uh, no, the, the microphone doesn't work? No. Keep speaking. <laughs> Um, keep so, speaking, keep oh, speaking. Oh, okay. So I, uh, I want to start immediately with my uh, first uh, question to uh, uh, Laura, um, in, in order not to waste any time. Um, Laura, can you describe uh, um, the uh, Neapolitan novels uh, in a nutshell? Thank you. Um, yes, well, uh, uh, the Neapolitan novels can be described in a nutshell as the, the story of a friendship between uh, two women, Elena and Lina, throughout 60 years of Italian history. It's a friendship that begins when they are in uh, first grade and they both live in a poor and violent uh, uh, Neapolitan neighborhood, but soon their paths diverge. And uh, in fact, Elena is allowed to go on with her studies uh, and to become eventually a successful writer, while Lina, uh, in spite of her many gifts, is obliged, or perhaps to some extent, to some extent, decides to stay in uh, Naples, and she engages in a series of commercial and, to some extent, uh, even political ventures that are at times successful, but that also and with a significant uh, series of setbacks, uh, most notably the mysterious disappearance, probably the kidnapping of a, a little girl. So already this you know, uh, is uh, a reason why the Neapolitan novels are very uh, important, because this focus on uh, uh, a friendship between uh, women is uh, an absolute uh, novelty, I think, in Italian literature, and uh, it's pretty rare in uh, international literature as well. We, um, you know, we may want to remember Virginia Woolf, who in a room of one's own lamented precisely the fact that women uh, are not only mostly represented by men, so written about by men, but are also very often imagined uh, only in relation to the other uh, sex. So it is, there is definitely something very, very new uh, about Elena Ferrante that has, uh, you know, has struck uh, the Italian public and later on the international public. Uh, yes, yeah, so you uh, <coughs> mentioned the friendship uh, um, between these uh, two uh, women, but uh, it seems to me that it is a uh, peculiar peculiar kind of friendship, um, which involves also a great deal of rivalry between the two of them, right? Yeah, definitely. In fact, as you progress uh, in the reading, uh, you realize that friendship is almost an inadequate word uh, to, des to describe the, that combustible mixture of uh, uh, love, uh, emulation, uh, rivalry, as you said, um, between uh, between the, the two, and this is really uh, really a, a very um, a very interesting point. And this, the complexity of this relationship, is revealed pretty early on in one of the founding episodes of the friendship. You you may recall in the first book when they the two 
or they are still in elementary school, they set off to go and uh, uh, see the ocean because they live in Naples, yet they have never seen uh, the ocean. It's a memorable episode. They don't go to school. They uh, venture out, but they miscalculate the distance. They are caught by uh, the rain, and they get into serious trouble when their mothers discover uh, what they've done. Uh, it's a very important episode for many reasons, but now I want to focus on, on, on the aspect related to, to the rivalry part, because um, uh, at that point in the story, it has already been decided that Elena will go on and uh, will go on to middle school, while Lena will stop her studies at the end of elementary school. And so the day after, when, uh, when the two see each other again, uh, Lena has a, a very uh, interesting uh, comment about this adventure. So this is from the first book. <laughs> so it's Lena uh, talking first. Uh, All they did was beat you? What should they have done? They are still sending you to study Latin? I looked at her in bewilderment. Was it possible? She had taken me with her, hoping that as a punishment, my parents would not send me to middle school? Or had she brought me back in such a hurry so that I would avoid that punishment? Or, I wonder today, did she want a different moment, both things? So I think this already shows very well how complex the relationship between the, the two is. It's, it's a relationship that uh, it's also uh, it's also linked to uh, class resentment at some level on the part of Lena and guilt on the part uh, on the part of Elena, who uh, is the only one, as I said, who will be allowed to go on and study. Well, but then um, is um, Lila the uh, brilliant <laughs> friend of the title? Yeah, that's uh, you know that's an excellent question. It's really a crucial a crucial question. Since uh, since uh, Elena is the narrator, the 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 readers become very familiar with uh, Elena's uh, uncertainties, doubts. Basically, Elena always fears that she's a bit of a fraud, that, that she would not have been able to accomplish anything without her friend's powerful input, right? And so uh, I think readers are really caught by surprise where towards the end of the first novel, they hear uh, Lina's voice who says uh, that uh, Elena should go on and study and she's, she's ready to pay for her studies. And she says, Lina says, because you are my brilliant friend. So there is a real uh, problem in establishing who the brilliant friend uh, really uh, is. And this ambiguity is probably linked to, uh, to the epigraph of the novel and also to the original uh, title. Uh, the novel uh, uh, begins uh, with a passage from Faust, from Goethe's Faust, which says essentially uh, that uh, uh, God, after creating man in the, in the book, uh, was afraid that uh, this creature would, uh, would not be eager to produce and to create. And therefore, God says in this passage, I created you a companion who will act as, as a devil and will force you to, to, do, to do your best. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, an epigraph that only makes sense if you then link it to this ambiguity uh, of, of the title, right? Uh, Elena uh, is Lina's double and vice versa, and perhaps the, the, the real title should be in the plural, the, 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 bri the brilliant friends. And uh, one, more, one more thing about this is the fact that the Italian title, L'Amica Geniale, actually hints precisely at this uh, ambiguity because uh, uh, the, the, the geniale comes from uh, genius, uh, which in Latin is precisely a guiding spirit. So the, um, there you have it, you know, uh, Lina is uh, Elena's guiding spirit and also a bit of a devil, uh, also because of the rivalry that you, uh, that you mentioned, uh, and vice versa, of course. So they, they, are, the, 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 they are genial only, they are brilliant only uh, when they are taken as a, as a duo. And this is one of those 
cases in which uh, the translation uh, cannot uh, really capture all the, all the layers of the original, I think. Um, let's talk about the language um, a little bit, about um, um, translation. Are there any instances where uh, uh, the translation uh, betrays the original? Yeah. Well, it, it, translating Elena Ferrante it was an, an extraordinary endeavor, right? Because the, uh, the the four novels have appeared in Italian w w each year from uh, 2011 to 2014, and the English translation uh, uh, by Anne Goldstein has uh, they have come out exactly one year after, so from uh, 2012 to 2015. So it, it must have been an extraordinary. Uh, a commitment, an extraordinary amount of wor uh, work to be able to uh, bring, put out these translations in a timely, in a timely fashion. Uh, the, and the translation is very smooth, very easy to read, perhaps sometimes is too easy to read, while Ferrante is a very uh, expressive writer who's not afraid of challenging uh, the reader, uh, he's not afraid of being awkward at times in order to convey uh, her meaning. And uh, this process of domestication, if, if you wish, of Elena Ferrante really begins with the, with the titles. And I, I brought you here just, uh, just uh, as, a, as a visual aid, the, the titles of, uh, of uh, her novels. So th this is uh, the, the title of Ferrante's first novel in Italian, L'amore molesto, a very disturbing title, right? Because it couples uh, the most, uh, you, the most uh, abused, perhaps, uh, noun in, in literature, amore, with uh, an adjective that is linked to unwanted attentions, to dangers, even, even right? Uh, as you can see, the, the, the English translation uh, T turns yeah, exactly softens it, you know turns down the volume a notch right a troubling love is not quite as challenging it's not quite as as disturbing as as uh, l'amore l'amore molesto and uh, if you so uh, l'amore molesto came out in 1992 and then uh, then there was uh, i giorni dell'abbandono then elena ferrante's third novel uh, la figlia oscura uh, La figlia oscura, what does that mean? Uh, the, it, it is really an, an obscure title in a way, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's really strange. The, the, the literal translation would have been the obscure daughter, which of course is kind of, uh, kind of awkward, but so is the Italian, right? Dark. But dark, I thought that dark would have the complication of uh, possible racial implication. Huh? I thought that dark could be interpreted as the color of the skin. Uh, but anyway, the lost daughter is really, really very recognizable. You know, there are a bunch of novels that are titled, you know, that are titled The Lost Something. Uh, it's also somewhat misleading because there is and really a lost daughter in the novel. The, 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 so uh, it's uh, it, it's really a strange a strange decision. Also, uh, also there is another problem with this title, uh, which is that when we get to the third volume of the of the trilogy, uh, Storia della bambina perduta, has been translated as the story of the lost child. Where so you see the the bambina has become a generic uh, child, but also you have a strange uh, um, comparison, a strange link with the, 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 the other, the other, uh, can you? <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, no, uh, forward. Yeah, the lost daughter and the, the next one, yeah, exactly. As you can see, the lost daughter and the story of the lost child they are very, very similar, and there, there is no reason why they should be similar, right? Because the, the, the original title was La Figlia Oscura. So, so that's another uh, uh, unfortunate uh, consequence of this, right? And, uh, and one, one last example, Storia di chi fugge e di chi resta. Fuggire is not the same thing as, as partire, is not the same thing as, as andare via, right? Fuggire. Uh, implies uh, implies uh, a, a danger, right? Implies, and perhaps if we if we assume that one who's uh, fleeing is uh, Elena, perhaps also implies a certain guilt towards a friend who has stayed be behind to to take care of the dangers of the of the, 
difficult situation in Naples instead of just leaving, right? Again, the, uh, the, the translation really makes things much, much smoother, right? That there is no, no, no allusion to possible danger, to possible guilt, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it is a much smoother uh, translation. So these are just uh, some examples without getting into, the, into the, the specific passages of the novels where you can see that the, the translation perhaps sometimes domesticates Ferrantes. Ferrantes prose. Um, one more question. Um, in, is, um, well, how does the translation deal with dialect? Um, there is not much dialect in the, those novels, but, um, you know, a, a, at least an implication of dialect. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the this tension between uh, Italian and Neapolitan is absolutely central in the novels, although it does not create uh, particular problems for the translator, because actually there are only a handful of Neapolitan words in the novel. So many, many times you, you hear so and so uh, say this in dialect. Very often, actually, people shout in dialect, curse in dialect. Uh, his, in the case of Lina, in, in dialect, uh, but uh, the, the narrator sticks to, uh, to Italian. So this tension is absolutely, absolutely crucial uh, in the novels. Uh, and I'm really fascinated by the way in which Ferrante complicates the, uh, the, 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 the problems, <laughs> the, the issue, the tension between Italian and dialect. Because for reasons that that you know we don't need to, to to get into here, throughout the history of the Italian language, there has been this this dichotomy between it, Italian, the institutional language that you learn at school, uh, and the dialect, the, the the language that you start uh, learning as soon as you are born, the language of friendship and family ties, right? But Ferrante really uh, complicates this. Um, this dichotomy, because for her, dialect is essentially the language of violence, is the language of regression, because dialect is the language that, that you do not choose, that you cannot really transcribe, is made of incomprehensible sounds, is the language that forces you to accept your uh, social and family uh, dynamics. Uh, while, on the contrary, Italian is the language that promises to bring rationality in the world. It's a language made of rules. It's the language that uh, forces you to use uh, not your instinct, but, but your mind. So this dichotomy that uh, really continues you know, from the, the big first to the fourth novel is absolutely uh, central. In fact, at the beginning, we see that uh, Lina uh, uh, is special, is brilliant, also because she manages to use both dialect and Italian. There is a passage where uh, uh, Elena says, you know, she could say, you know, uh, lussureggiante, malvolentieri, so she could use a bookish Italian as well as she could use the, the, the dialect. Uh, but pretty soon, uh, Lina uh, loses that ability. She's no longer used, she's no longer uh, she no longer seems to think that that's something important. And as she withdraws more and more into the neighborhood, uh, she also loses interest in, in Italian. While Ellen really tries to, to learn Italian, and when, now when she uses dialect, she does it in a very self-conscious way. For instance, there is a, a, just a, a very beautiful line, I thought, when she comes back from Pisa, where she's studying, and she says, as soon as I got to, to the station, I started speaking dialect, as if to say, I'm one of yours, do not hurt me. So uh, now it's a very self-conscious use, use of dialect. And this, this, this tension between Italian and dialect continues until the, 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 the very end. There is another a passage in the fourth novel where the two, Ellen and Lina, are talking again but uh, uh, Lina is translating from dialect, uh, Ellen is translating from Italian, and so the narrator says, we, bo we were both speaking a false, a false language. Uh, and one more thing about this, we may wonder, what is the language in which Elena writes her book, her books? And uh, in fact, we know that one of the books, the book that uh, causes a stir in the, in the neighborhood because it reveals the illicit dealings of the Solara brothers. We know that about the, that book, uh, Elena 
uh, really worked on the dosage of uh, Italian and Neapolitan. She says, at the beginning, I thought I put too much dialect, so I took it away, then I thought that it didn't sound right, and I put some dialect back in. So she's definitely very aware of those implications. And we may also wonder, though, what was the language of her story, L'Amicizia? L'Amicizia is a story about her and Lina. So it's clearly the Neapolitan novels, right? It's the core of the Neapolitan novels. Uh, and so to go back to the rivalry issue, we may wonder whether uh, the fact that the novels are in Italian is another way for Elena to exert control over her uh, mercurial, unpredictable, Neapolitan friend, right? And there is that, that, that another beautiful uh, line there where she says, uh, I loved uh, Lina, I wanted her to last, but I wanted, I wanted it to be me who made her last, right? So it, 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 writing and writing in Italian as a way to assert, to assert uh, control. And in fact, uh, what happens then is that when, uh, when uh, Lina reads uh, L'Amicizia, uh, she realizes that Elena has broken her promise never to write about the two of them, right? And so she breaks all contacts with, uh, uh, with Elena, and this, in a way, is a, is a prelude to her disappearance at the end, and therefore at the beginning of uh, the four novels. So, it is precisely uh, her disappearance that sets, that marks the beginning of the narration. And this is not completely new in Ferrante because it seems to, do, to me that all of her novels somehow hinge on a, uh, on a disappearance uh, of, of something missing. Mm. Is this a question for me? Yes, it is a question. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for me. Uh, okay. Um, uh, the, the theme of uh, uh, disappearance uh, is really fundamental uh, in uh, Ferrante's writings. Um, and um, actually, uh, she seems to be haunted by it because not only her characters disappear, but um, outside of uh, fiction, the author herself uh, disappear. Um, we, uh, all we have is uh, a voice, uh, a pen name, and, um, and that's it, you know, and the author is not there. But um, I, I would talk about this, but first uh, I, I want to um, address the fiction. And, uh, um, um, and, uh, and, and I will start from the very beginning. <laughs> so uh, think about the beginning of uh, uh, the first uh, novel, the first uh, Neapolitan novel, uh, My Brilliant Friend, um, when uh, Rino calls uh, Elena to uh, uh, tell her that his mother uh, uh, has vanished. And uh, uh, she is really gone without leaving a single trace. And uh, not only she is vanished, but all her uh, things, uh, her uh, uh, clothes, uh, shoes, uh, even the photos, uh, uh, she even cut off her image from uh, the photos uh, with her child. And um, uh, so uh, this is um, interesting because uh, it means that from uh, uh, the very beginning, before uh, writing those uh, 1,500 pages. Uh, Ferrante uh, already knew exactly what her objective was. Uh, and um, uh, she had a very uh, precise um, uh, scheme in her mind that, that uh, led eventually to the disappearance of, uh, um, of uh, Lila, uh, which is very significant. Very significant in what way? What's the, what's the, the meaning of Lina's uh, disappearance? Uh, uh, well, um, Ferrante gives us uh, many clues uh, uh, in the course of uh, Lila's uh, life. Uh, and uh, she comes up with a, a, a brilliant word herself, uh, the word is marginatura. Uh, talking about uh, language and translation, is marginatura, which is uh, translated as uh, 
the dissolving of boundaries uh, or the uh, dissolving of uh, margins. And of course, this is uh, at best uh, an explanation of the term, but not a, uh, a real precise translation because the uh, Italian word probably is uh, impossible to uh, translate uh, in all its complexity. Um, but uh, in general, uh, um, it connotes the idea of um, loss of identity, of uh, uh, dissolving of the individual's um, exterior shell, so to speak, uh, um, uh, like the breaking out of uh, a mold that has become too tight. And um, the first time uh, we encountered the word uh, sbarginatura uh, in uh, the novel, um, uh, it refers to a copper pot. Uh, Lila <coughs> sees a, a crack on it, and um, it is as if uh, uh, its contents, uh, you know, whatever is inside uh, has expanded, has uh, uh, grown too big, and uh, the pressure uh, caused the pot to burst. Um, later on, uh, Elena um, talks about Lila's flesh as uh, uh, having the consistency and uh, the color of copper. And uh, in this manner, uh, Ferrante creates an analogy between the two images, uh, preparing us uh, for the uh, smarginatura of Lila. Um, but uh, I, I must say that uh, this is uh, not just a phenomenon that occurs with women, also men um, go through this uh, process of smarginatura. In fact, uh, uh, Lila first observes it uh, in uh, her brother uh, Rino when uh, they are still young, <coughs> still, uh, teenagers, and uh, she is uh, disgusted by it because uh, what emerges from this uh, broken shell is um, uh, his uh, uh, most brutal and uh, primitive uh, self. Um, uh, it's um, like, uh, well, Ferrante puts it in a, a, a very undelicate way. Uh, she says it, it's like um, uh, raw, senseless matter, uh, a magma, um, something that uh, doesn't have a human connotations, uh, that has lost all feelings and reasons. It's like a, a force of nature. And uh, this, uh, as I said, happens uh, with uh, men as well as uh, as women. Yeah. So, do, do you see a difference though yes. in the ways smarginatura applies to women as opposed to the way it applies to men? Is it a, the gender? Does it take on different meanings according to the, the gender of the person? Definitely. Thank you for this question because uh, um, Ferrante herself uh, um, in uh, more than uh, one interview talks about um, her uh, novels uh, as being feminist novels. And also Elena, uh, the character, uh, um, becomes famous uh, um, after she writes a feminist novel. And Ferrante puts it uh, in, a precisely, in a precise context, the context of uh, uh, second wave feminism of the 70s. Um, um, Know, where in literature uh, they were following the uh, theories of uh, Helen uh, Sixou and uh, um, others, theory called um, Écriture Féminine, um, which advocated the uh, um, inscribing of the feminine into the uh, language of text. But this is uh, a discourse for uh, another time, another place. Um, so going back to uh, the subarginatura in this context, um, it has to do with the uh, woman condition, um, with the uh, role society requires uh, of them and uh, the uh, personality that they uh, are supposed to, uh, uh, to adopt. And um, Ferrante's women uh, uh, submit to this condition um, for a while, and uh, and then they rebel. 
and when they do, they do it with a vengeance. It's uh, really like um, if they are subject to a, a force uh, that they cannot stop. Um, it's like an urge that uh, they cannot control. It's uh, the eruption of a volcano. Uh, and uh, these women actually are um, fighting for their lives. Um, this is a, a matter of survival for them. And, uh, and nothing else matters, not even the children, um, because uh, even the children are part of those boundaries uh, um, that um, shape the, their false personality. And uh, here uh, um, we get to a, a rather disturbing uh, point, because Ferrante uh, talks about motherhood uh, in a uh, way which is very new. Um, no one before her uh, has uh, ever desecrated motherhood the way uh, she does. Not even the um, uh, feminist writers uh, of the 70s. Um, because for, um, for Ferrante, the desecration of motherhood is not ideological. But it's visceral. Um, it's um, it's uh, biological. I uh, I would say. Um, and to give you an example, in um, uh, her novel uh, *The Days of Abandonment*, the protagonist Olga uh, talks about um, being. Uh, um, um, she says, "Nursing is uh, repulsive to me." and uh, um, she sees it as an animal function. And uh, she goes uh, even, uh, um, even further, uh, uh, talking about the, the stink of motherhood, um, which um, makes uh, uh, women less desirable to their husbands. So, um, uh, I want to make another point because the, um, this uh, relationship, uh, this conflictual relationship uh, that uh, these women have with their children is not only with their children, but with uh, their mothers uh, as well. They uh, actually uh, um, see it as a chain, as a uh, metamorphosis uh, uh, where uh, um, their mother's bodies morph into uh, their own and then uh, um, into the bodies of their children, and uh, and they want to break this um, biological chain. Uh, so what uh, comes out uh, is not a uh, better and uh, purified self, but it's uh, exactly what Ferrante calls the, the uh, um, raw, senseless uh, uh, matter, uh, all instincts and uh, no reason. And in the Neapolitan novels, uh, both friends uh, go through this process. First, uh, uh, Lila and then uh, Elena, when they uh, leave their husbands uh, for uh, a lover, uh, which, uh, um, who, by the way, is the same man as uh, uh, Nino, the, uh, the heartthrob. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and eventually, uh, they do undergo a change, but uh, um, it's uh, unfortunately not a change that solves the crisis. Um, actually, um, the, they, they fall into another mold, and then they have the need to break out again, and so on and so forth. So uh, this uh, disappearance is never definitive. Mm. Not even, not even. So, in which sense the disappear, Lila's disappearance? So, if I if I followed you correctly, <coughs> a Lila's disappearance could be a way to to break out of the, of the mold, right? I mean, to 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 to, to erase all traces. Uh, but uh, but so, in which uh, in which sense it's not that? Uh, and, well, uh, now you're talking about uh, the end, the very end of the story. And uh, uh, at that point, uh, when uh, Lila disappears at the very end, um, it's, uh, it's ambiguous. Um, actually, it's a, a literary trick because uh, uh, she does disappear from the story. Uh, she does disappear from the story, but she does not disappear from literature. <laughs> 
And what I mean is that um, uh, Elena, um, Elena wants to write a novel, writes a novel about uh, Lila, although uh, Lila had asked her never to do that, but um, Elena has uh, her reason. And uh, I want to quote uh, um, from what she says because the uh, precise words uh, are actually uh, important here. She says, I decided to uh, write a novel. She, she says, I decided to uh, give Leela a form uh, whose boundaries won't dissolve and, uh, and then defeat her and calm her and so in turn calm myself. Now, this um, sentence uh, is uh, significant in more than one way. First of all, uh, it uh, uh, refers to uh, creative writing, uh, to the uh, difference between art and life, where uh, a uh, work of art is a uh, finite, um, defined, contained uh, uh, form. Uh, while life <coughs> is uh, fluid, uh, it's, it's uh, ever-changing and, uh, and full of paradoxes and uh, messy. Um, and then it's significant also um, because uh, it implies the uh, peculiar relationship between the two friends uh, that you described already in detail. Um, a uh, hate-love, uh, love-hate uh, relationship, which includes admiration, but also uh, rivalry, and at times uh, a desire for mutual destruction. And so uh, um, here, uh, Lila, um, actually Elena, uh, again says something that uh, I want to read and that you have already quoted, but um, it's very fitting here. Uh, Elena says, uh, I loved Lila. I wanted her to last, but I wanted it to be I uh, who made her last. And so, uh, um, practically, Elena uh, asserts herself here. She says, I win. Um, you know, in the contest between the, the two friends. Uh, she again uh, puts uh, Leela into a mold. This time it's the mold of the novel, which is permanent, uh, and, um, and therefore it's uh, forever. Mm -hmm. So Leela's disappearance is a bit of a, a rebellion against, against that, perhaps. So anyway, the disappearance is, is a very, as you said, is a very important theme, starting from L'Amour et Molesto, eh, the Journey de l'Abandon, all, all of our novels, really. And uh, you mentioned, though, at the beginning that this could also be linked with the disappearance of the author herself, Valena Ferrante herself. Now, I'm not at all, you know, uh, alluding to the uh, supposed real identity of Elena Ferrante, but I'm, I'm interested in the, in the consequences of uh, this decision on us, the readers, uh, and uh, on uh, the rece uh, you know, reception of our novels. Hmm. Um, when I said that the, the author herself disappeared, I uh, um, had in mind the fact that we don't know who she is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so um, a great deal of speculation um, has um, been made about um, Ferrante's identity here in the States and uh, in Italy and uh, probably uh, uh, in the rest of the world. Um, and some speculation uh, even sinks to uh, the level of gossip when uh, some journalist uh, uh, once in a while uh, comes up with, uh, you know, the uh, scoop of the day, uh, uh, claiming that uh, he has uh, discovered who Ferrante is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but all this is irrelevant, and uh, it's actually, um, uh, you know, tabloid stuff. But what is uh, uh, interesting is what uh, Ferrante says herself. 
um, or uh, I should not say says, but writes, because uh, she uh, has uh, given many written interviews and also published the book um, uh, Frantumaglia, um, which is a word uh, her mother used uh, to um, indicate a bunch of uh, uh, diverse things and even fragments of things uh, jumbled together without any order. So uh, in Frantumaglia, she uh, collects uh, um, interviews, uh, letters, uh, uh, reflections, uh, um, diverse materials, and she talks about her work and um, uh, her role as an author. She gives us a very spare uh, um, factual information. Uh, so uh, what we know um, is that uh, she is a woman. Uh, she is from Naples. Uh, she is from a uh, um, working class family. Uh, she spent time in Greece. Uh, she has a degree in um, classical literature and she has a job. She works uh, as a scholar, a translator and uh, um, teacher. And that's it. We don't know any, any other facts about uh, her. But um, um, besides this, uh, she uh, also explains uh, why she decided uh, to remain unknown. And uh, practically what she says is that uh, she didn't want to play uh, the um, publishing industry game. Um, which is uh, uh, being paraded uh, to um, press conferences and uh, uh, book signing events where the uh, attention of the reader would be directed toward her as a, her, her person uh, instead of being directed to uh, her books. And uh, so she uh, um, didn't want uh, the uh, press to uh, fabricate uh, an image of herself um, and, and then use this image in order to sell the books. Uh, she wanted her books to stand uh, on, um, on their own and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be appreciated as such without a label attached to them that says uh, the author. Um, and um, in so doing, um, we go back to what I said about uh, Ferrante's women before. In so doing, she, she uh, um, acts exactly as um, those women do. She removes herself and she breaks out um, of the, the mold that, that in her case is uh, the mold as author. Uh, and uh, uh, so she rebels and uh, she, uh, she vanishes. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can just, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to hand you this uh, microphone louder so that when there are questions from the audience, I can bring a microphone around and people can hear them, okay? Okay. So you use this one? Yes. She was first. She was first. Who's first? She was first. Yeah. If she's so mysterious, speak right into it, like that. No, like this. Yeah. This way. If she's okay, if she's so mysterious, how do we know the facts that you brought up? Very curious. How do we know that those are facts or just part of the gossip and mm -hmm. so on? That's yeah. Maybe she said. Uh, the question for me, right? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> so it could be a, a man who's writing. It could be, but yeah. um, since we identify uh, Elena Ferrante with this voice, uh, there's only one voice, uh, right? Um, the voice that we uh, listen uh, uh, through her novels and uh, through her uh, interviews and so on, um, uh, we don't have uh, any uh, way of verifying it. Um, but uh, to a um, very precise question, uh, um, a uh, journalist asked her, says, um, 
uh, who is no um, yes who are you okay and uh, she answered I am Elena Ferrante I wrote six novels in 20 years is that, isn't that enough but uh, is the interview a uh, an interview that was heard or is it transcribed written. no written. they are all written yeah. all written yeah but Sorry, if I may just add, I think in another interview she also said, I'm not afraid of lying if lying helps me prevent um, uh, you know, the mystery. <laughs> you know? So I don't think that we should take anything she says at face value, you know. So yeah, she could be a man, she could be from uh, China, you know. <laughs> I've got, uh, I'll, I'll come to you, but I'll come to Luigi. I think he had his hand up earlier. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, there's a... Um, let me go to her, and then I'll come to you, fine. And then I'd like to throw in a question, too, but that's later. Um, I guess, okay. Uh, one of the, I, I, I've loved these novels. I've read them through twice in English, and, and just think it's spectacular, and I'm still trying to come with, to grips with a lot of things about what she's revealing about herself. And one of the big, my, an overriding question that I have is that there seem to be no happy events here, even when there's a wedding or when there's a baptism and things, the normal things that most of us find a little bit of happiness in life. And there just doesn't seem to be anything here. And I'm curious how, uh, what, how you feel about this. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's uh, probably an outlook that she has. Uh, it's a, it's a literary persona that she, I think she chose very early on, and she's very consistent, if you wish, in this negativity, you know. Uh, even in that representation of motherhood, uh, actually, you know, as Ron mentioned, I, I wrote a book about the representation of motherhood, and she's definitely uh, so constantly negative, you know. Uh, even, if, if, even mothers who have, you know, an ambivalent, uh, I think to some, some extent, most mothers have an ambivalent relationship with, with motherhood, but it, it's hard to find that, that, that kind of uh, uh, uniform disdain for motherhood that she expresses. So definitely, in that sense, she's a very uh, negative writer, if you, if you wish. And uh, I can add uh, um, something here uh, that has not, nothing to do with motherhood, but when uh, um, Elena um, publishes her book, her first success, uh, she uh, calls uh, Lila to, uh, uh, you know, her the, uh, um, the, the, this uh, wonderful news, and she says, I am so uh, happy, uh, just like uh, an astronaut that um, stepped on the moon. And uh, Elena, um, <laughs> I mean Lila, uh, pours uh, cold water uh, on her, saying, uh, um, oh, well, you know, the moon is just a rock in the universe, and uh, we'd better uh, stay with our f f feet uh, planted on our little rock here. So, <laughs> negativity is uh, um, all, all over. Look, I've, uh, <coughs> I can't tell whether I've uh, read just the first of the novels, looking forward to the next three. Uh, absolutely wonderful, incredible story. Uh, I, mean, I, I have a few, uh, there was a few disappointments in my reading. And you touched on some of them. Uh, and I'd like to hear your uh, impressions. First of all, this business of the, the Neapolitan dialect. It was disappointing to me, in fact, to someone not from Naples, but who loves Naples, not to just run across this uh, she said this in the Neapolitan dialect. It was almost like this, uh, it was as if it was the N word somehow. Uh, what, I, I, uh, I'm wondering, I haven't seen an Italian edition, but in the Italian edition, do they not, tra do they not tra translate? Yeah, they, yeah, they're, they're uh, it, it seems to me that the, the rich, the Neapolitan dialect is a, is, is a rich, colorful, expressive language, and, I would think would have uh, would have enjoyed it more having not seen this dialogue quote in the Neapolitan dialect. The other thing, uh, slightly disappointing uh, to me, was uh, 
the story, as wonderful as it is, could possibly uh, uh, could have taken place in almost any locale. I really, as someone who's been to Naples and who lived in Naples, I didn't get much of the color and the excitement and the energy of Naples, especially from a Neapolitan writer. I don't know if you might have had the same. Uh, it could have happened in Mass, but Long Island or just about anywhere. <laughs> Uh, well, about about the dialect, I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. There is no di virtually no dialect in the uh, in the Italian or original. Uh, there is actually uh, there is one scene. Uh, in the, I think it's in the second novel when uh, when Le uh, Lina um, insults her husband <laughs> Stefano, and she uh, that uh, which which. Uh, you know, creates, which uh, causes a, a furious and violent reaction in Stefano. And uh, at that point, the insult is in, in Neapolitan. It's actually an insult in Neapolitan. I think that there is a very precise reason for that. The, 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 you know, the, the insult reaches Stefano precisely because it is uh, in, in Neapolitan. I, I, uh, well, many, many Neapolitan writers actually have uh, in a, uh, have not a, a, do, do not have a, 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 an idyllic vision of uh, of uh, Naples. Uh, so I'm not I'm not surprised actually that a writer, even if Elena Perrante, whether we don't know whether she is or she's not Napolitan, but that, that, that somebody who uh, pretends to be in the story, a narrator who uh, is in Naples, I don't I'm not surprised that that person doesn't have uh, a, a a more uh, idyllic version of uh, Naples. Naples is there more with its problems, its, its violence, and uh, uh, the story begins in the, uh, right after the, the war, right, uh, and uh, where Naples was, uh, Naples was, Naples was bombed heavily during the war, so it's really a, a very, a very, very dire circumstances that, uh, that are described in the novel. And uh, if, you, if you progress in the readings, Naples is very much there, but very often with, it, with its problems uh, like organized crime uh, and um, the, the earthquake at some point. So. Uh, just one more point. Uh, uh, perhaps the fact that she doesn't uh, use the, uh, the Neapolitan dialect uh, um, is because she's not Neapolitan. <laughs> this is a, another clue <laughs> you know, to add to the, to the other stuff. That, that gentleman's uh, uh, comment actually segues well into my uh, sort of two-part question. One was whether you, or not you had any thoughts about the, the author's uh, portrait of Naples. Uh, in the story and how she characterizes the city. And the other is, did you have any thoughts about how she characterizes the politics of the 1960s and the Red Brigade and intellectual life, which are, um, and also thank you very much for your extremely insightful comments about um, this. I've learned a lot from listening. But um, not being Italian, not being familiar with intellectual life in Italy during that period, or the history of Italian literature and intellectual life. I wondered if you could comment on how she characterizes um, that. Uh, is it for me, the question? Um, okay, well, I start. Sure. Um, so uh, the first part was uh, about uh, um, the representation, of, the representation Naples, of Naples, yes. Um, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, well, there is a very little representation of Naples uh, in uh, Naples, in my uh, opinion. Um, most uh, of the um, um, action is uh, in a uh, suburb of Naples, uh, uh, in a uh, um, you know slum, uh, if you want. Um, we don't see uh, any any of the uh, great beauties of Naples. Um, they are uh, alien to the uh, characters uh, of these novels. Uh, they do not belong on Via Carattolo or, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the other beautiful sites. Um, and uh, besides, uh, some critics also noticed that um, 
uh, the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the the scenery is uh, rather uh, uh, bare. Um, I mean, um, like in a, uh, a Greek uh, tragedy, uh, so that uh, the absence of um, of scenery, uh, scenography, if you want. Uh, um, uh, brings to the, the uh, fore uh, the uh, uh, emotions uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the internal drama uh, of the characters. But there are writers who have done that. And as I was, as I was uh, uh, talking about the passage uh, when they set off to go see the ocean, I couldn't help but thinking once again of uh, Anna Maria Ortese and her collection of stories titled precisely <laughs> Il mare non bagna Napoli. You know? So there is definitely a certain tradition of writing about Naples, but in those terms, not, not about the, the more, uh, again, idyllic uh, uh, version of Naples uh, that, that, that I think it, uh, are, is very present to her mind. Uh, I'd like to ask a quick question, then I can hand this off to somebody else. So, uh, two things. First of all, I would like to argue that, uh, in fact, um, the genius friend is really Lila. And I would argue that because uh, at the very beginning of the novels, uh, first of all, she's the one who has the initiative and the power. She's the one, by the way, who throws the two dolls into Don Achille's basement. Uh, she's the one who uh, leads uh, Lina to uh, confront Don Achille. Uh, she's the one that the Maestra Oliveira says is the brilliant one because she taught herself to read uh, and so forth. And uh, throughout the novel, of course, there's this rivalry that occurs, but she is the one who motivates a lot of the action and a lot of the response on the part of, of Lean in the novel. That's the first comment I would make. The second one is that uh, I learned a lot from these novels, maybe about women, maybe about myself in connection with women, um, but I didn't learn a lot about men because I think the men are sort of caricatures in these novels. They're, they're two-dimensional by comparison to the description of the women. So I'd like to have you comment on these two aspects. Let me comment on the first, I don't want to spoil the the, 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 the ending for those who haven't read the for novels, but there is an episode at the very end that uh, seems to imply that Lila is actually the one who has inspired everything. That when uh, Elena thought that she was asserting her control over uh, Lina, it was actually Lina, uh, you know, behind the scenes who was inspiring her all along. Uh, the, the, there is an episode. The very, the very ending of the novel seems to hint at that, uh, at that possibility, right? So, so, uh, but that, that's not necessarily the final word, though. But it's definitely another episode in this never-ending, never-ending. Uh, but the two dolls are restored by. Yeah, that's that's the that's the episode I didn't want to mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, men, 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 men. No, I, I um, agree with Ron uh, because uh, uh, I think that they are there uh, as, uh, um, you know, second character uh, um, to, uh, um, in, in Italian, we would say, uh, fare da spalla. Yeah, supporting, <laughs> support, 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 right? supporting actors. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, Ferrante is uh, not very interested uh, in uh, those figures, but uh, she uh, creates uh, a personality that may serve the, um, um, the advancement uh, of the narrative uh, or uh, the uh, development uh, of uh, the female character uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, men in uh, themselves are not a um, focus of uh, Ferrante's interest. Could you, could you please say, say something about the relationship between Elena and her mother? 
because you know it's the mother really who supports her and who wants her to go to school and is proud of her but then on the other hand she is also very tough on her and then they have this falling out and so on I found this very interesting uh, yes, as I said, uh, it's a, a very conflictual uh, uh, relationship. And um, Elena, um, it's almost, uh, sometimes uh, she is uh, ashamed of what she thinks uh, about her mother because uh, she sees it as an inferior uh, um, person. Um, she uh, is also not very beautiful, but um, <laughs> in, in the, uh, Elena's objective uh, is uh, to become something completely different from her mother, to uh, uh, break the ties and, uh, um, and move away. Um, and uh, I, I guess uh, it's, uh, it refers to her, uh, one uh, um, particular um, thing that comes to mind. Uh, she feels at times uh, the uh, um, body of her mother's uh, crawling into herself. Uh, and, um, and this terrifies her uh, because <laughs> she doesn't want to uh, become the same person as uh, her mother. Yeah, I'd like to add that <coughs> there is that, that uh, physical detail, right? Her mother has a problem with her, with her leg, so she's always limping, and one of the fear of Elena is not to be able to walk. At the very beginning, she says, perhaps that's why I got so fixated with Lena, because she was so fast. And I thought that if I, if I were always to run after her, my mother would, would have never caught me. Yeah, her, she has a, a fear that actually feminist critics have, uh, have invented a name for this, ma matrophobia, which is the fear of, it's not a fear of the mother, it's the fear of becoming like one's mother. And this is very, very strong. <laughs> this is very, very strong in Elena Ferrante's novel, in, novels in general. What is new here is that uh, uh, Lina, and here I go back a little bit about the, the 60s, the questions about the, the 60s. Here there is what in Italian is called the sorellanza. So the space that is uh, left vacant by the mother is filled by this brilliant friend, right? Uh, who, who is really, the, really the, 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 the companion, the rival, and feels also an a, a, a emotional need. Uh, this will probably be the last question, but of course you'll have the opportunity to speak to both of these guests of ours um, during the uh, portion of our program here where we have refreshments. And uh, uh, we're going to, I don't know if we have enough for everybody, I hope so. We want to have uh, a Prosecco and a Brindisi for everybody, so, uh, and we have uh, several bottles, I guess, of it, so. The speakers first. But also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will, I will do that. before we do that. So there is one more question, and it's from this lady. I, it, it really is a kind of complicated question, I guess, in the sense that I wonder if you could speak to, again, this scene where Lena throws the two dolls in the basement, and I was thinking about some of the earlier questions and the idea of play and creativity is transformative and liberating and dolls is representing something along the lines of that and then the fact that this main character entraps them and throws them back down and I was wondering about so much around duality light and dark liberation and masochism is she in some way so fearful of the mother and the feminine that she identifies with the sadistic and the male. I mean, that scene is one of the best scenes I think I have read, and I read a lot. But I, could you comment on your own thoughts about that? Because it's a foreshadowing that's so complicated, and I think it does capture what is so hard to understand about their relationship. Um, Okay, it's uh, a very complicated scene and a very complicated, a, a very ambiguous uh, uh, feeling that uh, you get from it. Um, uh, as for the dolls, um, they uh, have played um, a very important role in uh, other novels of Ferrante. 
um, for example, uh, um, the uh, La Figlia Oscura, the uh, lost child. Uh, as you have seen from the cover of that novel, there's a doll. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, in a, a very ambiguous uh, um, pose uh, with this, uh, um, this coat uh, opened uh, in the back, uh, showing her back. <laughs> Um, so um, the, the whole novel uh, is very uh, ambiguous and the ambiguity hinges uh, on uh, the, um, uh, this object, uh, this doll that uh, um, creates a drama, um, a drama for uh, the little girl that uh, loses it, but also um, a, a drama for the reader because uh, we question the motives uh, of the protagonist uh, that steals um, that doll and uh, um, doesn't have any uh, any sympathy uh, for the poor girl um, that uh, has lost it. So um, I uh, don't know exactly. I, I cannot tell you what exactly means because uh, Ferrante herself uh, in an interview uh, says that uh, she cannot answer the question <laughs> they asked her um, about the doll and she says well it remains something um, mysterious uh, to uh, myself as well yeah no, it's a very complex symbol you know you can think of uh, women's uh, women's condition, you know, uh, imps and a doll's house. You can think of them as, as doubles. Uh, you can think they are also linked to the to the to motherhood, uh, and they're also linked to to creativity because they do come back. And in the first uh, and in, the, in in that first episode you mentioned, it's also uh, right Lila who initiates this uh, this game, so to speak, with the with the dolls. So it's a very complex symbol. I don't think there is one uh, one one easy answer, but definitely a crucial symbol in, in, in not only in the Neapolitan novels but also in uh, in the video school. One association I had was the Greek tragedy and the idea that there was a foreshadowing of what life was going to be like, and that and controlling it by in some way. Interesting. But now that I, just by by uh, listening to you, I was uh, I just thought of another possible meaning. Since the doll at the beginning is thrown in in the basement, I was thinking of uh, Freud beyond the pleasure principle, where the, the fourth da game, where the the, the, the child throws a, a toy away because uh, that way he thinks he can control how people in his life are going to appear or disappear according to his wishes. So it's definitely a very complex, very complex symbol. I think